And I'd like to talk to you about those few formulas that you need from chapter three, which are the mean, the median, the mode, the standard deviation, the variance, the range, the coefficient of variation. We can do them all in five minutes, and that's what I hope will be valuable. So we're dealing chapter three is, of course, uh, called descriptive statistics. And descriptive statistics are those formulas that help you describe and summarize numbers, including making a pie chart or a histogram that describes and summarizes numbers. And calculating an average or calculating a spread of the numbers also summarizes the thousands of numbers down to a couple of numbers. So this chapter breaks up into two pieces called measures of central tendency, which is the most important thing to do when you're summarizing data. Get the middle of all the numbers, because the middle number sort of represents everybody. Measures of central tendency. We'll talk about a few formulas you need to know here. And the second formula is called measures of dispersion. The second part of the chapter is measures of dispersion. And in statistics, generally, there are many, many formulas of each type. But we're going to focus on just a few of the main ones. So the, the ones that we need to know about are the mean, the median. And I'm not even going to talk, I won't mention it, but I'm not going to show you the moment. So the mean, of course, is the formula that is symbolized by x bar. x bar equals summation of x over n. I mean, that's the famous, you add up all the numbers, divide by the number of numbers. And if you pick the small example of three numbers, the same size of three, of two, four, and six, the average would be, you add them all together, so the sum is equal to 12. And the average would be 12 divided by three, because the sum is 12. And the sample size 12 divided by three is four. And that's, you know, basically, that, that, that's the, you can't get any easier than that. And it turns out this is the most important formula of the entire term. Everybody knows that. That's good to you know that. And as you change the numbers, and so the problem with the, the mean is a great formula. That, you know, it's very easy to understand, easy to calcular. But the problem is if you have an outlier, like this is 6,000, it's going to mess up your whole thing. So we, we, of course, the problem with the outliers, we have a second formula called the median, which doesn't have a symbol, but basically, you try to break up your data into the 50%. Half are below the median, half above the median. And when you find that number, or sometimes it's more than one, one number, then you, then you solve the problem. So if we had the example of 2, 4, and 6, the median would be, of course, 4. Because there's one person, think of three people taking a quiz on a test. One person was below 4, one person was above 4. So 4 really breaks it up into 50, 50. But if I change this to 2, 4, 7, and 11, what's the median now. Well, here there's no middle number, but there are two middle numbers. So you take those two middle numbers and you sort of split the difference between them. 4 plus 7 is 11. 11 divided by 2 is 5.5. So 5.5 would be the median in this case. So that's one, that's probably the best answer you could put down if somebody asked you to calculate the median. And if this was an 11,000, the median would still be 5.5, because there's two people below 5.5 and two people below, above 5.5. So 5.5 is definitely the median. And you can see right away how the median is not affected by the outliers, which is a pretty good thing. Now, what about 5.4? Somebody put down 5.4 on the test. Would I have to mark it right? Well, technically, yes, because how many people scored lower than 5.4? These two guys. How many people scored higher than 5.4? These two guys. So 5.4 also breaks it up into 50-50. So which is the right, better answer? I think 5.5 is a better answer, but it's definitely a right answer from a mathematical point. View. So you have to decide between mathematics versus practicality. Mathematically, they're both right. Practically speaking, I think 5.5 makes more sense. Now let's we'll come up to a third example. What if this was a what if this was a, a 2, 5, 7, 11, another 11, and this was a 13? What's the median now? I'm not sure myself. Hold on. 2, 5, 2, 4, 7, 11. It's 11. No, it's not 11. Nope. Anybody have, there is this answer. This, anybody, have, what's the, anybody have another guess? What's the answer to this one now? Raise so your hand if you want to. Lisa, Could it be 10? Try 10. Okay, 10 works. Okay, how many people scored lower than 10? One, two, three people. How many people scored higher than 10? One, two, three. So 10 works. 10 is the median. Are there any more answers? Yes. Nine. Nine works as well. Three people lower. So this and then, this is not, not the example that I meant to give. I wanted to give you an example where there is no answer, but this has more than one answer. It has a million answers. So this is correct. Now let's try it one more time. So is it clear why 9 is the right answer to everybody who's sitting over 10 or really? 7 plus 11 is the middle number is what? 18, 9. 9 is, the 9 is probably the best answer, but the 10 works as well. Now, what about if this 7 was made into an 11? 
2, 4, 11, 11, 11, 13. Yeah, this is, this is the example that I meant. When there's repeats near the middle, you get this paradox. OK, what's the, anybody have an answer now? There's oh, somebody up besides these two guys. OK, your, your answer. It's on the time. But let's see. Well, first of all, yes and no. From a practical point of view, you might say, well, 11 is sort of near the middle. So 11 seems like the right answer. If you put down 11 on the test side, it's sort of, especially if it's in a good mood, I have to give you credit for it. So in a certain practical sense, 11, if you type this into a computer, I think the computer would spit out the number 11. But if you look at it very honestly, very mathematically, is there an answer? Well, not really. How many people scored lower than 11? Two people. How many people scored higher than 11? One person. So it's not 50-50 as it was until this point. So technically speaking, there is no answer, even though, again, so we're in a sort of paradoxical situation. We're we'll facing back, please, to, oh, no name though. I noticed that. I would have noticed that. It would have been a mistake. Thank you. OK. Yes, uh, David. I think David. No, Nate. Nate, sorry. So if there is no answer, what? No, no, so I think if you have to give A answer, 11 makes the most sense, right? I think if you type this into a computer, you can either type it into Excel and ask for the median. I think it's going to give you 11. It's not going to say no answer. It's going to say 11. All right, because I was going to say, if you do like 5, if there's 2 above 5, then there's 2 above 5. Well, okay, you got to pick a number. Pick, pick, it's got to be one number. We can, say, we can test it if it's right. Pick a number. Which number are you talking about? Um, pick a number after our median? Yeah, you think it might be. 5. No. Five, two people scored lower than five, and four people scored higher than oh, five, so, so it's not 50-50. I mean, you only really get something which is 50-50. Yes? Um, if you're writing the answer is 11, but the median is 11, because I thought it was 11, so. But 11 is right from a practical point of view, and I think it's the most commonsensical answer, and I mark it right. I'm not going to try to give you trick questions on the test. I'm just telling you, you should be aware of the fact that, you know, although if it happens by accident, then we'll worry about it then. I mean, this is not, it's a trick question. There is no answer to it, technically. Yes, no name? Oh, sorry. Uh, can you expect me to read that? Ross. Okay. Uh, what if you said something you uh, above 4 but less than 11? Above 4? I mean, yeah, above 4 but less than 11. No. You're like, like, try it. How about 10? That's the number that's before. Yeah, Does 10 work? No. Oh, 10 doesn't work, so that's it right. And you can prove to yourself if you're right or wrong. Yes? Okay, stop right there. That's, that's, the, that, 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 that's the next one. We'll, we'll move on to that right now. That's the next one. That's the next half of the chapter. Now we have to talk about measuring dispersion. And I gave the example where you have two different set A and set B. Let's go quickly for up there. You have set A is 50, 70, and 90. And you have set B, which is, let's say, 65, 70, and 75. And then you've got a 98 on a, on a quiz or a test or whatever. And you, which is, and you want to interpret how impressive the 98 is and you say, well, 98 is more impressive coming out of this class, most people believe, even though we talked about it and we said you can prove either one of them. But the point is, when you start thinking about which class has, gives you a more impressive, 98 look more impressive in, then you realize both classes have a middle value of 70. You both have a sample size of 3. The only thing is this class is more spread out, this class is not so spread out. So the spread well, the dispersion is clearly a critical number when you're really making interpretations of data. That's what I tried to give you by this brief example last time. But now that we understand that it's important to measure dispersion, let's measure the dispersion. And let's begin with an example like 2, 4, and 6. And one way of measuring dispersion is by the range, which is the max minus the min, which in the case of here will be 6 take away, six take away 2, or 4. It has to be in this case, will be 75, take away 65, or 10. So it's simply the highest minus the lowest, which sounds like a great formula. The problem with it, as I talked about last time, is that it's more complicated than you think, because first of all, the, the extreme numbers control off your whole calculation. The middle numbers don't really affect the calculation. We like our numbers to affect the calculation. For example, if this was a this was an 89, the answer will still be 90 minus 50, will still be 40. So no, changing one number radically doesn't change the answer. means there's something wrong with that formula. So for those two reasons, plus the third reason, that as your sample size gets larger and larger, eventually somebody is bound to get a number higher than this or lower than that. So that the range seems to be a function of the sample size. That's a subtle point that makes the range not a great formula to use, except for perhaps in quality control, where you're comparing sample sizes that are equal. So for that reason, we're going to have a second formula called the variance. And to be technical about it, it's called the variance of the sample or the sample variance. But we call it the variance. And that has a symbol S squared. And the formula for the variance, which is another way of approaching